Thank you. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. So today we're going to discuss uh, serverless and more specifically serverless Java. So basically where Java fit within the serverless space. Before that, some logistics. So my name is David Albasset. I work at Oracle in the serverless team. So I report to a team uh, in the US. Uh, but I'm, I'm from Belgium. So I live in Belgium. And uh, well, I'm, so I'm not French, but I have that funky French accent because I'm from the French speaking side of Belgium. So I told you I work at Oracle. So this was me in a conference some time ago in Sweden. And someone tweeted that it's not a real conference unless you read Oracle Seferber statement at least once. So it is. And last but not least, so today basically we'll discuss serverless Java. And I'm going to do a few demos to show uh, how that works. I'm, I'm using one of the, those new MacBook Pro with the butterfly keyboard. And if you are a user of that keyboard, you might, well, you might know that there are a lot of issues with that keyboard. And in fact, not later than last week, Apple has fixed for the fourth time the keyboard, and people are still complaining that it doesn't work. So basically today, if any of my demo fails, it's not my fault. It's because of the keyboard. And I'm serious about that. OK, let's discuss serverless, and more specifically, function as a services. So whenever I said uh, serverless today, I really mean function as a services. So let's try to clarify what function as a services is. So first, we have this notion of a function. A function is basically a, sw a small piece of code with one job. So it's a well-bounded piece of code that will perform one given task. The function will get something in input that will trigger its execution, and the function will produce most of the time an output. So it's not necessarily a function as we have in mathematics than in the sense that a function can also have some side effect, like, for example, putting a result in a cache. And you, developer, will basically focus on writing those functions. So the function is basically the fundamental unit of any fast platform. It's a function, it's, it's a unit of design, but also the, uni the unit of deployment. And we then have this notion of this as a services piece, which is basically the platform. It's the compute element on which your function will run on. So we can distinguish two types of role, two types of responsibility. On one hand, we have the function developers, typically you, who will write a function. And you will then give those functions to someone else, to a fast platform. And it's up then to the fast platform provider to make sure that everything works. So that, inclu that includes the provisioning of the platform itself, uh, the maintenance of the platform, um, everything which is tied to security, the scaling of the platform, and so on and so on. So within any fast context, we have these two roles, function developers and fast platform uh, providers. And today, I'm going to switch between the two roles so that we can see sometimes what happened behind the scenes. So clearly, there are a lot of interest in the market for uh, serverless, and more specifically, uh, for function as a service. So there are already a lot of offering in the market. Now, whenever we discuss function as a services, sometimes people tend to uh, oppose uh, serverless function with containers. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Because if we peek under the hood, you will see that all the fast platforms are using containers. Sometimes they are using containers explicitly. So you can see that, indeed, containers are used under the hood. And some other fast platforms are just using containers without exposing that. But again, it doesn't really matter, because you will see today that you don't need to understand how containers work to, you to write serverless functions. So let's dive in and talk about Java within the serverless space. So we know that Java is a very popular programming language. Um, it has been used for many years. And depending on where you look at, Java is first or second or third. And if, anyway, we can all agree that Java is a widely used popular programming language. That's a given. Now, if we look at Java within the serverless space, we don't have a lot of metrics. But the few metrics that we have aren't that great for when it comes to Java. So uh, this is a poll that was conducted by the serverless frameworks uh, people. So basically, the serverless frameworks is, um, is a framework that sits on top of existing uh, fast platform. It's basically an abstraction. And you can use multiple languages to write your function. So the question was, what are you using in terms of programming language to write your serverless function today? And you see, we have this big uh, green arc, which is node 6, uh, over 70%. If you add that to node 5, which is just above, well, 
persons. So over 75% of users of the serverless frameworks are using Node and hence JavaScript to write serverless function. We then have Python, uh, let's see, uh, Python 3.6 and Python 2.7. So roughly 15% uh, are using Python to write uh, serverless function. And if we continue, we have this little yellow box at the top there, which represents Java, Java 8. And it's below 5%. So clearly, that's one of the metrics that we have, and it doesn't really look great for Java. That's another metrics, and it was the second question. So the first question was, what are you using today to write function? And this question is, what are you planning to use uh, in the future to write function? And basically, well, you can see that Java is pretty flat, around 5%. That's the orange line that we have in the middle. Node 6 is not even on that chart. It's way above. So clearly, we see that at least today, Java is not very popular um, in the serverless space. So how can we explain that? I mean, on one hand, we have a very widely used programming language. And on the other hand, we have this new emerging space where clearly that programming language is not very popular. So first, we might want to look at the historical fast landscape. It's a pretty um, new landscape. But if we look at the three major uh, fast platform, well, we see that we have Amazon. So Amazon, I think they are good because they are supporting Java 8 since June 2015. So Amazon is doing a good job in terms of supporting Java. When it comes to Microsoft, they are only supporting Java since uh, February this year. So it's, a, it's pretty new. And Google, Google Cloud Function, they are only supporting Java since April, so basically last month. And it's Java 8, and it's in alpha. So it's not even GA. So the fact that the major fast platform providers except Amazon, doesn't have a very good Java story, might explain partly why Java is not very popular yet in the fast space. Something else that we think might explain why Java is not very popular in that space is the fact that if we look at, at that's basically a trend when it comes to Java. So basically, startups are using the, any kind of programming language, basically the programming language that, that they like, and it's only when they need to mature, when they need to scale, that they are switching to Java. So we might expect over time to see, um, let's say, node serverless function to switch to Java when basically the, those, kind, those type of services need to scale, needs to uh, be more mature. That's just a guess, but it's an, it, that's a trend that we have observed multiple times, so it might probably also apply to the fast space. Something else that might explain why Java is not widely used in that space is maybe Java is, is not a good fit for writing serverless function. We know that Java has been uh, designed for, write, for running long-running uh, application. It has been tuned for that. We have hotspot and so on. And serverless functions are by nature ephemeral. So a function is short-lived. The function will be invoked. It will perform its task. It will live for 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, maybe one second, and then it will die. Maybe the, the GVM is too expensive for writing that kind of very short-lived application. Who knows? So when at Oracle we started to work on our fast platform, uh, we basically wanted to make sure that Java could be used uh, within that space. So we set ourselves some kind of goals, some kind of blueprints that we want to achieve. Uh, the ability to use plain old Java, the ability to keep existing tool chain, something which is important for Java developers. Also, having the ability to build complex applications. I will come back to that later. Then we have this whole question about very short-lived application. Uh, that's something that we need to address on the Java side. And finally, we all know that the Java virtual machine ecosystem is very rich. So that's something that uh, we also need to account within the fast space. So, to illustrate that, I will discuss and show you FN. So FN stands for function. It's basically an open source fast platform. Um, so it's an open source project that Oracle is contributing. Everything is on GitHub. It's an Apache V2 license. And one of the benefits of having a fast platform uh, open source is that basically you, as a user, can take the platform. So you can take the platform and run it in any type of cloud. You can run FN on top of Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle Cloud. It doesn't really matter. The thing that you have to keep in mind is that if you are doing that, obviously, you will have basically have to deal with the two roles. So you will be the function developers, but you will also have to uh, manage the platform. And there are clearly some use cases where it makes sense to have those two roles. And you, if you understand that, that's perfectly fine. If you don't want to manage the platform, 
well, user managed version of FN, such as Oracle Function, for example. One of the other benefits that we have with an open source platform is that you can also take the platform and install it on your laptop. That's what I'm doing uh, here. That's something which is obviously very convenient for a developing function. So technically, FN is written in Go. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, at the end of the day, this is an infrastructure project, such as Kubernetes or Docker, and all those projects are written in Go. Go is a very nice language for that, kind, that type of project. But still, as I told you, we wanted to make sure that Java was a first-class citizen on top of that platform. So you will see basically how, ja how it works, and you will see that Java is nicely supported within FN. Last but not least, in FN, FN is a, what we call a container-native fast platform. So that means that everything in, F in FN is basically a container. A function uh, is simply a container. Now, it's not you as a developer who have to write a Docker file and so on. It's something that, that is managed by the platform. So as a function developer, you just provide the source code of your function, and it's then up to all the FN tooling to basically convert that into uh, Docker containers. And if you, don't, if you don't understand how containers work, that's perfectly fine, because everything is handled by the platform under the hood. So let's have a look at FN in action. So, I told you that we can have FN running on, on, on a local laptop. The only thing that you need to have is basically have Docker running, given that everything is based on Docker. So I have Docker running here. It's empty. So I'm going to start FN. So for that, I'm using this FN uh, CLI command, which is basically uh, your gateway to FN. So with FN CLI, you will start, stop FN, you will have access to uh, statistics, you will have the ability to configure FN, uh, deploy your function, test your function, and so on and so on. So, FN is now started in detached mode, and if I look at my uh, Docker, I have an instance of a FN server running. So the next thing that I want to do, I want to create a function. So, for that, I will use the CLI again, so FN init, and given the context, I'm going to use uh, the Java runtime. And finally, I need to give my function a, a, a name, so it will be called Duke. So out of the box, if I just specify Java, that will be a Java 11 function. So if we look at what has been created, we have a few files. So we have two class, hello function.java, so that's basically our serverless Java function, so it's a hello world function that you can easily extend. And we also have these hello function test uh, classes, which is basically a, a GUnit based test uh, to test our function. And we have those two files here. So we have a pom.xml, so basically in FN, a Java function is simply a Maven project, so that gives us the ability to keep using our uh, tool chain. And we have this func.yaml file, which is just a file that contains some metadata about the function, like, for example, the name of the function, the version of the function, the runtime that we're going to use, the two type of image that the platform is, is using. So we're using two type of image, a build image that is based on a GDK uh, image that the, pr the platform provide. And to run the, the function, we are using a GRE uh, image that is also provided by the platform. Again, you don't necessarily need to uh, understand that. The only thing that you might want to know is the, the last line, which is basically um, the entry point of the function. So com.example.fn.hello function, that's basically our class. And in this class, we have handle request, which is simply uh, the Java method that corresponds to our uh, serverless function. So we have a Maven project, so we can use Maven, so Maven test. And our function is built locally, and it's tested using Maven and GUnit, and obviously uh, it passed. So the next thing that we want to do, we want to run that function to see what it does. So for that, we need to create an app. An app is just a namespace, so basically a way of grouping together related function. So let's create the G-Prime app. And if we look in the G, so let's list the app. So FN list, and we have a bunch of apps, including G prime. And if I look, so functions in J prime, it's empty. There's no function for uh, in J prime now. So to run the function, I need to deploy it. So FN deploy within the J prime app. Um, 
I don't need to specify the function given that I have a local.func.yaml. But to see what's going on, I will have the verbose flag and I will also add uh, minus minus local so that we can save some time. So basically, this is, this is uh, what happened behind the scenes. So basically, you see that the FNCLI uh, is basically using uh, Docker to, um, to build the function itself. So everything is, is, is done within Docker. So we are using Docker to build the function. So basically, uh, we have a jar. So uh, here, Maven. So the output of that uh, Maven package is a jar. And next, the CLI is using the GRE image, and it's a multi-stage Docker build. So basically, it takes that, uh, that uh, jar, so the, our function itself, and it put it uh, within that image. And that will basically be our uh, serverless Java function. Again, I'm just showing you how it works behind the scene, but that's not something that you need to uh, necessarily understand. And now, obviously, we can invoke the function. So fn invoke, the function is in uh, the J prime. Uh, app and it's called Duke. So it's a simple hello world function, right? So let's have a look at the code. So given that we have a Maven project, again, we can keep using our uh, tool. So so if we look at the source, so we have two, two class here. So that's the, the test and source main. And that's the function. So it's a simple uh, function. So you see, it basically, it has one method. That method has been defined in the func.yaml. Uh, in this case, it gets a string in input, and it would produce a string in output. So uh, well, this is a simple uh, basic function that you will uh, use to basically start your function. The thing that you, need, you should notice here is that there is no annotation, there is no interface. So this is really plain old Java code. There's nothing specific here uh, for fn. Now, I admit this is pretty basic, so let's do something like this. So let's create a new Java type. So let's create an event type. An event has a name, obviously, and an event has a date. I need a constructor. I need a default constructor, and I need Gather and setter. So what we have here, we have this new event type, which is pretty basic. And what we're going to do here, we're going to create an event object. Uh, we're going to use the input as the name, and we're going to use the sorry, the date as the lo the, uh, the now date as the date. And instead of returning the, the string, we're going to return that uh, object. It doesn't work because I need to update the signature. So we have changed the method, the, sorry, the, the, the serverless function to basically it get a string and it will produce a new uh, event type. So um, let's deploy that. And maybe I should explain why I, we have this minus minus local flag here. So basically, whenever we build a function, the function, so it's a Docker image, and it's being pushed to a registry that the platform will use. Given that everything is local, I'm just uh, skipping that, that step just to save some time. So let's run that function again. So fn deploy. So the function is being rebuilt, and the Docker image of the function is also being rebuilt. And it failed. Anybody has a guess why? So if we add the minus v, we'll have a verbose mode. And basically, yeah, it failed because of the test. So I need to fix the test. <laughs> Wait. It will work. Oh, and I removed the, the minus minus local, so it, now it push the Docker image. So you see, my tests are now fixed. Um, now, that's something that you can do on stage in front of an audience. I mean, removing the test to fix them. But please don't do that at home. So now I have my new function deployed, so I can invoke it. So fn invoke, uh, it was j prime, and it was duke. And I have the ability, obviously, to pass it some payload. Uh, j prime, whoops. 
Right. Let's GQ that. Oh, so you see here, that's what I was uh, telling you. So you see here, there's this space, and because of my uh, funky keyboard, this is not a space, this is just something else. So if I do that, so watch. This is real space, and now it works. So I wasn't lying when I told you that the keyboard break my demo. So this is now the output of the function. If we look back at the Java code, again, this is plain old Java. So the only thing that my function uh, gets is some string, and then it produces in output this uh, event type that I've just created. So uh, this is something that is possible because FN provides a Java FDK, so a function development kit. So the Java FDK provides uh, support for GUnit, support for Maven, but also input and output coercion. So that's the ability to pass some JSON payload that will be automatically converted to a Java type, and that goes obviously in two directions, so input and output. Um, the Java FDK also provides the optimized image that we are using to build the function and to run the function, so that's basically uh, some of the capabilities are provided by the Java uh, FDK of FN. So the idea is that if you are using the uh, Java FDK, you have the ability to write a serverless Java function using plain old Java. So you see that there were no specific uh, code related to FN when it comes to our serverless function. And we were able to basically keep using our tool, uh, existing tool chain, like Maven, uh, IntelliJ, but I could have used Eclipse or NetBeans. It just works. So something else that the Java FDK provides is the ability to build complex applications. So remember, at the beginning, I told you that um, a function is short-lived. So a function are ephemeral, so a function will be invoked, it will perform its task, and then it will die maybe one second later. That means that if you need to hold some kind of states, you shouldn't hold the state within the function. It would be just too expensive to do that within the function. Having said that, there is a specific use case where it makes sense to hold the state within a function. And that is when you want to compose together multiple functions. Basically, um, think the following. You have a function that will invoke another function. It will wait for the result of that invocation, given that we are going through the network. So it's an asynchronous operation. Once the main function has the result of that invocation, it will in invoke another function, and so on and so on. Not only that, some of the invocation might fail because we are going through the network. So that's what FNflow provides. So FNflow gives us the, uh, the capability to basically do function orchestration. So it's basically exactly that. So we have functions that can orchestrate the execution of multiple uh, functions. If we look at the API of FNflow on the Java side, it's very similar to the compression stage API that we have in Java IC. At the end of the day, those API are performing are offering the same capability. So in Java IC, we have the compression stage API that gives us the ability to define a pipeline execution of asynchronous task. And FNflow is basically about the same exact goal, except that we're not talking about uh, asynchronous execution of, uh, sorry, uh, pipeline execution of asynchronous task, but we're talking about pipeline execution of function, which are by nature uh, asynchronous. Not only that, we also have to go through the network. So that's basically the fundamental difference between the two. One, everything is done within one single process, that's the compression stage API, and the FNflow API, obviously, given that we're talking about function, we're going through the network. But from a programming standpoint, it looks exactly like the compression stage API of Java IC. So we have this notion of a flow object. So the flow object is basically an object that will contain the result of an invocation, a future invocation, the result or uh, an error, because uh, something might go wrong. So if you look at the second line, basically that's where we define the pipeline execution. So the first thing that we do, we're invoking a function, so uh, hey func, it's the function that I want to invoke. And then once we have the result, we're using this then apply to basically do something with the result. So what we do there, we are just defining the pipeline execution. Nothing happened there. It's only when we are doing a get that we're basically asking the platform to trigger uh, that pipeline execution. So to illustrate that, typical trip booking uh, scenario where we basically want to book a trip, so that means that we want to book uh, a flight, an hotel, a car, and once we have done that, we want to send an email to the users. 
So to do that, we have on the back end multiple functions. So one written in Java, another one written in, written in Ruby, another one written in JavaScript, and so on and so on. And what we're going to look at is this uh, trip booking function that will basically do the orchestration of all those backend functions. And that will be done using the Java uh, FNflow API. So um, if we look, if I, oh, sorry, Docker PS. So I have, I need to uh, do, again, I need to, I need to take my uh, fast platform provider hat and need to start a few things. So I'm starting three additional containers. Uh, so we had FN server running. And then I'm starting a flow server. So that's basically a not just a server that will uh, manage the state of the function orchestration. So that one is really needed. The other two are just needed for my demo, so that we can see basically what happened uh, behind the scene when we run on this demo. So if we look at the apps that we have, we have a bunch of apps. And you see at the bottom that we have these travel apps. So if we look, so FN list function within the travel apps, we have a bunch of function. And I forgot to do something. I need to configure my. So, oops, sorry. Uh, LSFN. So, the trip. A uh, function at the bottom is the one that is the function that we want to invoke. That's the one that is using the flow API. So to do that, I have some sample payload that I will pass uh, to this function. So fn invoke, um, the application is travel, and the function that we want to invoke is called trip. Now, that's where the additional containers that I've started uh, will come into play because that will, they will help us to see what's going on uh, behind the scenes. So I'm just realizing that I'm almost, so there is no power on that. So my battery is about to die, and there doesn't seem to be any power here. So, hello? <laughs> um, I will be out of juice very shortly, so. And I still have to 22 minutes, so if you can help me, that would be nice. So, um, yeah, so, I, uh, so basically, this small server will help us to see what's going on behind the scenes. So I'm triggering that, and if everything goes well, well, we can see that basically uh, the trip booking function is, is, is booking a flight, it's booking an hotel, and it's booking a car, and finally, it's, it's uh, sending an email to say to the user, OK, uh, you're good. We have booked that trip. Now, we can also see that invoking a function was quite expensive. Four seconds uh, is relatively expensive. But if we start it again, yeah, this one, maybe. So if we invoke it again, let's do it. Let's invoke it again. We see that it's way faster. Why? Because the FN platform is basically keeping uh, the function containers hot for a given amount of time, so that the next time we have requests coming in for uh, that type of function, we basically reuse the container just to save on the subtop time. So what we can also do, we can make this demo fail. So for example, each time I'm going to invoke, uh, each time I will try to book a car, it, it will just fail. So that was the happy pass, and this is the broken pass. And so we are booking a flight, we are booking a hotel, and you see that we are not able to book a car. So what we are doing here, we are basically uh, implementing the Saga pattern to basically roll back all the transaction. So uh, we cancel the flight booking, we cancel the flight, and we'll, sorry, we cancel the flight, we cancel the hotel, and we cancel the car. So that's something that we can easily do given th uh, that we have the FNflow API. 
So that's basically the FN, so the FN flow. It's not limited to Java, but what I've shown you here is that we are using the FN flow on the Java side to orchestrate function written in any type of language. And we also have an implementation of FN flow uh, in Go. So you can also do that in Go, but having said that, it's easier to do using Java. So the ability to build complex application is something that we can certainly uh, do with a serverless Java function. But again, this is not something that uh, you can use to do any type of application. It's only when we need to orchestrate multiple functions together. Then you can use something such as FNflow to easily do that. Now let's talk about the latency and the performance that we expect from serverless function. Basically, we want for any type of uh, serverless function, we want it to, to start as quick as possible. And when it comes to uh, serverless Java function, we basically expect two things. We also expect it, that function to start as quickly as possible. And we also expect the Java virtual machine that runs within our uh, containers to respect the environment it runs in. So basically, it needs to respect the fact that it runs within containers. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because it's very busy. But what I'd, the takeaway here is that uh, since Java 8, we are doing the investment in the Java platform to make sure that Java can work nicely when it runs in container. And that's something that is important. So for example, the, the, the Java virtual machine has this ergonomics capability where it will basically look at uh, the platform it runs on. It will look at the number of CPU, the number of uh, memory available. And basically, based on those metrics, it will try to auto-tune itself so that it will, uh, out of the box, give some reasonable performance. If you're not using a, a recent uh, Java version, uh, the GVM will basically see those, the metrics coming from the host and not from the container itself. So if you are running your container that is limited to one CPU on a host that has 32 CPU, the GVM will use these 32 uh, CPU metrics to basically try to tune itself. And you can uh, expect some bad results uh, very quickly. So, Nevertheless, that's something that we on the platform side manage for you. So you don't have to uh, basically uh, choose which version of the GVM you want to use and, and so on. That's something that uh, we're handling for you. Next, we want our Java code to start as quickly as possible. So there are multiple things that we can do. One of the things that we can uh, leverage is CDS, class data sharing. It's something that is available, available in the platform since Java SE 5. And the idea of CDS is that whenever you start a Java application, so Java dash jar, your jar, your jar will be unpacked, and all the classes will basically uh, be loaded into memory. Now, loading the, all, the, all, all those bytecode in memory, so all the classes into memory, there are a lot of things that need to be done on each classes, like some verification and so on and so on. Not only that, there are a lot of classes. The idea of CDS is basically to do that once, and once this is, this is done, uh, the GVM will take an, a snapshot of the in-memory representation of the classes and dump that to disk. And the next time uh, the application starts, that uh, dump will basically be brought into memory directly, so, you, so, that, so that you don't have to go through all those steps again and again each time you start your uh, Java application. By doing that, you will at least guess, get a 25% startup improvement uh, on your uh, Java application. That's obviously something that we are leveraging on the Java serverless side. So at the beginning, Java SE 5, CDS was for the runtime classes. But since Java 10, we have application CDS that we can also use for application classes. Now, given that uh, serverless Java functions are relatively limited in terms of uh, classes, it's maybe something that we don't necessarily need. But at least uh, CDS uh, is something that is very useful for us. Now, we also want our container to start as quickly as, pos as possible, regardless of the fact that it's, it's, it runs a Java function. Um, for that, we have to think about the fact that basically a container is made of multiple layers. And on the Java side, we have three types of layers. The operating system layer, the Java runtime layer, and the Java function layer with all its dependency. So at the Java function uh, layers, there's not much that we can do. The only thing that we can uh, do is basically give you some advice, like, well, check your dependency. Uh, check the transitive dependency. Don't bring any uh, dependency that is not needed, those kind of uh, recommendations. But there's not much more that we can do. But on the other hand, at the Java runtime layer and the, at the operating system layer, there are quite a few things that uh, we are able to do. 
One of the things that uh, we are working on is basically um, using a lighter Linux distribution to run the serverless function. Uh, the idea is to use uh, Alpine. So Alpine is a highly optimized Linux di distribution that weighs less than five megabytes. Um, but there is a basic issue with that. So um, Java, OpenJDK, is built against JLibc. Alpines rely on vessels. So basically, we have this project, uh, Project Portola, whose, whose goal is to build OpenJDK on top of Muscle so that we can use OpenJDK uh, on a distribution such as uh, Alpine. So that's one thing that we can do, basically trim down the operating system layer. At the Java runtime layer, there's something that we can easily do, and that's basically leverage, leverage the modularity that we have in the platform since Java uh, SC9. And you know that we have in Java SC9, we have Jlink that gives us the ability to create basically a custom runtime that will only include the module that our code needs. So to give you some idea of the benefit that we can uh, get by using Jlink, I took a whole GDK 12. So let's say 320 megabytes for a whole GDK. So first, uh, an advice, whenever you need to run serverless Java function, uh, don't run your function within a GDK, because there are a lot of things that are not needed when you run your function. You don't need Java C and so on and so on. That's something that we handle for you. But um, that's nevertheless something important to keep in mind. So we always, to run our function, we need a GRE. There's no per se G, uh, GRE for Java 12, so I took a distribution of a G, GRE of Java uh, 11, and it's basically 100 megabytes lighter. So just by switching from a GDK to a GRE, we already save uh, 100 megabytes. Now, um, we can create our own GRE using Jlink. So in this case, I've created a GRE that includes all the modules. That's a very stupid idea. It defeats the purpose of Jlink. And also, I'm not sure there is a technical way of writing an application that uses all the modules. But nevertheless, this is just to give us some idea. So a GRE that includes all the modules, 168 megabytes. We can remove some information from that uh, GRE, like the header files, for example. If we do that, we save another 25 megabytes. We have two levels of compression. Compression 2 will trim that down to 83 megabytes. So you see that, well, we are getting somewhere. But obviously, uh, the end goal is to use Jlink as it was, as it was designed. So uh, here I'm using Jlink just to create a GRE with the modules that are needed and just the modules that are needed for uh, our serverless Java function. If we do that, we're going down to uh, 47 megabytes. We can remove some information that is not needed, 41 megabyte, And if we're compressing that to the max, 32 megabytes. So basically, by using Jlink, we can go down from 168 megabyte, a GRE, down to 32 megabytes. The idea here is basically that we want to shrink as much as we can the layers of our uh, serverless uh, function, because each time we need to start the function, the Docker image of the function needs to be loaded, loaded from the registry. And obviously, you don't want uh, that Docker image to be uh, multiple megabytes in terms of size. So that's what we are doing that. Having said that, if you look at the, the, the last line, compression 2, 32 megabytes, compression means that we have uh, to basically decompress. So maybe the, the 10 megabytes that we will save by using compression, we will lose that benefit by paying the cost of uh, uncompression at front time. So that's an exercise that we still need to do to see if it's really needed to go down from, from 41 megabytes to 32 megabytes. So let's have a look at how you can do that uh, in FN. Oops. So I'm going to create a Java function but that uses Jlink, but this time I'm going to use a different approach, Jlink init, and I'm going to give it a very meaningful name like Jlink. So um, let's run that. And deploy minus app j prime minus minus local uh, j link and minus v. So the function is, is deployed. We can invoke it. So if and invoke uh, j prime uh, j link. So it's a very basic function where you give it a day and it will uh, answer you something. That's not really the point. But let's have a look at the size of this function. So for that, I'm going to use dive 
that will help us to see what we have in terms of layering our uh, Java function. So this is our Java uh, function. So the first layer, that's the operating system layer. That's Alpine, 4.1 uh, megabyte. 2.4 megabyte, second layer, it's basically the, oops, sorry. That's basically the function, which is here, function.jar, and it's dependency. So if we look at the function itself, it's pretty light. It's three kilobyte because it's very basic. So we basically have over two megabyte of dependency that are mostly needed by uh, FN itself. And we then have this 33 megabyte layer, which is our custom GRE. So basically, 33 megabyte, we have a full GRE that uh, is needed to run our function. And finally, we also have this uh, 20 kilobyte. Uh, that's just a share object that's needed by the platform. So basically, by using, uh, by combining uh, JLink and uh, Portola, so the ability to use Muscle and Alpine, we have a Java function. So the, the, the Docker image of a Java function that only weighs 40 megabytes. And that's obviously something which is important when it comes to startup time, because that 40 megabyte will have to be loaded from the registry. It's way better that if you, that he, if you had a function that weighs 700 megabytes. And you see that, basically, to create that in FN, the only thing that I had to do was simply use this uh, init image capability. So it's pretty straightforward. We can, Google, we can do better than that by using Graal. So Graal gives us the ability to basically, well, so Graal is an open source uh, polyglot virtual machine developed by um, Oracle Labs, and it provides many capabilities. But one of the capabilities that it provides is native image. So native image gives us the ability to start from Java bytecode, so a pure Java application, and basically turn that Java application into a native uh, binary executable that will be run on a target platform, such as Linux, for example. So to do that, again, very simple in FN. So basically, that's the same command. The only thing that we need to say here is we want to use the native image instead of, and that's the Graal is the function. So Graal is the function name, basically. So to run that function, uh, well, I first need to deploy it. I won't do it because it takes uh, over two minutes, and I only have uh, eight minutes left. But I already deployed that uh, a bit earlier, so let's look at the apps that we have. And uh, yes, the first one. So fn list function within the Graal application, and I have a function that is called native, so we can invoke it. So Graal native, hello BCN. So if we look at the image of that function, So that's the different layer that compose our function, our uh, native function. So 4.4, that's the operating system layer. And then we only have this 16 megabyte layer. And that's basically a Linux executable. So if we look here, we should be able to see that it's uh, Linux uh, executable. And that's basically our serverless function. It includes everything. So that means the function itself, but also uh, a virtual machine that is embedded in one single uh, binary. Because we are starting from Java code. So for example, our uh, Java code expects to have, for example, memory, memory management provided by the underlying GVM. So what is done here is that uh, Graal is embedded substrate VM within our binary to provide those capabilities. And again, the idea here is to reduce as much as we can the size of the final uh, Docker image, 21 megabyte for a function that includes a Java function that includes the operating system, the Java runtime layer, and the function, everything embedded within one single binary. Not only that, if you're using RAL in this case, you will also save in terms of uh, memory, uh, memory consumption. So low latency, high performance, I think that you saw that we have tools and techniques on the Java side that can help us to reach the latency and the performance that we expect from uh, within the serverless space. Now, let's quickly talk about the rich uh, virtual machine 
Java virtual machines, sorry, the rich Java virtual machine ecosystem that we live in. So you know that every six months we have a new Java release. That's one thing. You know that we have Java, the programming language, but we also have other languages that run on top of the, G, the GVM, such as Kotlin, uh, Groovy, you name it, right? And then we have other projects, such as Graal, for example. So those kind of things leads us to uh, the init image capability that you already saw when I was using uh, JLink and uh, the Graal native image capability. So basically, we have added a capability that help us to cope with the, the rich uh, GVM ecosystem that we are in. And to show you uh, something else, so, so today, the current Java release is uh, Java 12. But using the init image capability, we can already write a serverless function using uh, Java 13. So uh, let's see, uh, Duke 13, meet. So you see, this is basically pure Java 12 code. So there's a new switch expression statement, uh, but just to prove you that uh, this is Java 13. Uh, system. Uh, I think it's Java version. Please correct me if it's not that. Um, yeah, it should be that. Uh, yeah, and something else is that when I started to program, I was always told to use meaningful variable name. So now in Java, you can use a variable. I mean, as in variable, right? Again, don't do that at home. I'm very bad at cracking bad jokes, sorry. So fn deploy. Um, mine is up, uh, so we want to deploy that within J prime and uh, yeah, should be good and we're going we won't push the image and let's see if I did any typo and it built so it should be good. It don't build. Uh, get property that's the keyboard that's not me property property yeah. You should help me because I have a small screen, screen and you have a huge screen, so. Okay. So fn invoke, uh, we want to invoke the function in J prime that is called Duke 13. And you see that what we have is indeed 13 early access. So we are ending running on top of a, a Java 13 GVM. Something else that I can show you is uh, this. So, I'm, so basically, I'm using the FNCLI to invoke my function. That's just a shortcut. But obviously, at the end of the day, uh, you want to use something else to invoke your function. So uh, inspect uh, J prime, and the function is called Duke 13. Uh, J prime is not, no, sorry, inspect function. And you see that by default, we have an invocation HTTP endpoints that we can use to invoke our function. But we can also uh, define new triggers like another HTTP triggers. What I'm doing here, I'm running FN locally, but obviously at the end of the day, you want to uh, deploy your function within the cloud. So for that, you just need to use a different context. So I'm going to use an Oracle Cloud context. So FN use context OCI. And if we look at the apps there, FN list apps, you see that we have different apps. So FN creates app, J prime, uh, yep. And I'm going to deploy that. So now I'm going to deploy this in the data center in the US. So I can't use the local flag because I need to push my Docker image. Well, the CLI need to push the Docker image to the registry. And that's what is being done here. And if I inspect that again, uh, oops. Duke 13, so you see that I have an HTTP uh, endpoint that I can use to invoke my function over the, over, uh, the cloud. So the init image capabilities all allows us to really support uh, the GVM ecosystem. Not only that, that's something that you can also use to add support for new language. Last month, someone has added support uh, for .NET, for example, on top of FN. So that's something that helps us to basically make FN very open. So rich GVM ecosystem. Yes. 
So serverless Java, does it have a future? Absolutely. We clearly think that with projects such as OpenGDK and GraalVM, it's just the beginning. And to be fair, today I've used FN because Oracle is working on FN, but there are other fast platform, open source fast platform that are also leveraging OpenGDK and uh, GraalVM. So clearly, uh, Java has a very bright future within the serverless and the function as a service space. So the call to action, please give it a try. Everything is there. It's open source, github.com slash fn project slash fn. That's the main repo. You just need to have Docker installed on your machine, and in less than two minutes, you will be able to uh, start the platform and bootstrap and run your first, first function. And if you, if you like what you, well, if you like it, please give, it, give us a star. It's free, and it's something that is always appreciated. So I will just conclude uh, by mentioning that Oracle has announced Oracle Function, which is our managed fast platform. Under the hood, it uses FN. So if you don't want to manage the platform by yourself, well, give it a try to Oracle Function when it will be available. We will have a free tier, and you, can, you will be able to basically uh, do tests and see uh, how things work. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you.